Ready? There. Thank you so much, Katrina. I'm happy to introduce. We have two uh, representatives from the Clark County Sheriff's Office tonight, and I'm just going to say their first names because they said I could, and let them introduce themselves further. Um, we okay. have Sergeant. Well, okay, Sergeant Dennison, Tom, Tom, and we have Scott from Search and Rescue. So I am so happy. Y'all took some time. I'm sad one of you especially already said today's your day off and here you are and i appreciate you coming in to do this with us tonight um i invite the participants to settle in and take a deep breath and utilize the next two hours to learn and participate as as closely as you can thank you so much i will turn it over to i suppose Tom, are you going to be first? Yeah. So uh, my name is Tom Dennis, and I'm a sergeant with the sheriff's office. I've been here since 1999. I started in the jail. Uh, I work primarily in training now. Um, when I say training, I I, I am in, in charge of uh, training all the deputies that that work at the sheriff's office. I do work patrol sometimes too, um, just uh, for overtime and and just to just keep familiar with what's going on on the road. Um, I have a bunch of different hats here, just like uh, Deputy Gilberti does too. I'll let you. I'm Scott Gilberti. I'm a deputy with Clark County Sheriff's Office. Been here since 2008. I've been a search and rescue coordinator since 2010. Um, in addition to that, I work on the boats. I work road patrol and a couple other things that I won't get into. Yeah, we all have multiple hats here usually. Uh, so uh, when we're talking about interacting with law enforcement, we're going to kind of go down two different paths tonight. Um, we're going to start with that search and rescue issue. Um, primarily, our contact would be, hey, we've lost a loved one, whether it be a child or an adult. Um, how? What can we expect from the sheriff's office? Um, what do they expect of us? Uh, and then, then we'll kind of switch gears and hopefully that uh, PowerPoint will kind of answer a lot of questions for you. And then we can talk more about um what happens if there your your person or a person gets thrown or, or gets contacted in, into the criminal justice system like they're arrested or we're there for a criminal matter versus a search and rescue matter so um i'll let scott primarily talk about the search and West rescue stuff because that's what he does um i usually if i am looking for somebody I, I call either him or one of the coordinators so uh, if you want to share a screen on that PowerPoint, or if you want to start with the PowerPoint versus the forms, I guess. Yeah, let's start with the PowerPoint and we'll get into the forms later on. And are you controlling that or do I have the ability to control it? I'm controlling it. Okay. So you'll just have this to kind of, This is going to be a kind of a, just a real quick overview of what the SAR system in Washington is and what it looks like for the sheriff's office and kind of uh, getting into some of the resources we have and uh, how that works when we respond to a call. So you can go ahead. So it'll recover, cover the, uh, the state law, our policy, uh, overview of search and rescue and kind of what to expect from the initial responding deputy. You can bring that whole, that whole slide up. So this is from uh, Washington State Law, uh, Revised Code of Washington, 13-60-010.1b. Uh, uh, and it def really defines what a missing person is. So uh, they've changed it over uh, recently to include uh, now, starting in July this year, uh, a missing indigenous woman or, or indigenous person, a person with a development of dis disability uh, defined by RCW 71A, a uh, person who's believed in be in danger because of age, health, mental or physical disability or combination uh, along with the environment and weather condition uh, or someone who's not able to return home safely on their own. And then it kind of goes on to define uh, in some of the other linked laws what that how they define developmental disability and vulnerable adult. You can go ahead. So this kind of outlines our, our policy. I'm not going to read through all of it, um, but it's pretty much laying out that when, when we get a call of a missing person, 
the first responding deputy needs to make contact to gather information. And really that's the key to this is uh, finding information, gathering information. Um, and it's a lot about how that process works. Uh, feel free to distribute this PowerPoint if someone needs it. Uh, it's not protected material. So if someone wants to read through this and have, a, have an idea what that policy is, they can have it. You can go ahead. So this just includes more about the policy regarding what our supervisors are required to do when we get these calls. Um, and a supervisor's job is, is to be aware of the call and to oversee it and to kind of help determine the urgency and what other resources are needed for that call. So search and rescue in Washington is a, mostly volunteer, most of the people involved in search and rescue in Washington are volunteers. It's a volunteer uh, heavy system where a bunch of different teams uh, are scattered throughout the state. Uh, there are usually nonprofit organizations that provide training and organization and equipment for their searchers. All that's managed at the state level by the Washington Military Department and the Emergency Management Division. So regularly we get training, us deputies who are coordinators get training from them about how to conduct these uh, search and rescue missions. And then we get to the local level, the top law enforcement officer for that jurisdiction, whether it's a chief or sheriff, is responsible for search and rescue in their jurisdiction. I already talked about, it's a volunteer organization. Um, and it's kind of coordinated through an incident command structure similar to major fire incidents. We just had the big fire in Clark County recently, and there's the incident command structure where you have an incident commander and different divisions that come out from there once that gets, gets started. Go ahead. So here locally, uh, the main team we use for search and rescue is the Clark County Sheriff's Office search and rescue team. It's a civilian team. Uh, there's about 80 people in that team now uh, with various levels of experience and specialty. Uh, a lot of those, almost all of them are certified ground searchers. So that'd be, be the people hiking in the, the woods, walking the streets, uh, using their, their feet, their hands and their eyes to search uh, for whatever they're searching for. We also have different canines. Uh, we have tracking dogs, trailing dogs, and there's some difference in those. Uh, a lot of that dog uh, <laughs> stuff is, is confusing even to me who's been a coordinator for 12 years, uh, but we have dogs that can take a scent article from a loved one that's missing and smell for that specific scent. Other dogs might just follow the trail uh, of disturbance left by someone in order to try and kind of generally find a person. And then uh, in the unfortunate event, we have a a fatality or deceased person, we have human remains detection dogs as well. Um, technology is ob obviously huge in search and rescue. And now we're at the point where um, a lot of search and rescue eight, uh, teams throughout the state have drones where they can get above, use video cameras or even thermal imaging to help find, find people. We have horse teams here in Clark County, uh, a communication team that helps us uh, keep our radios and that verbal contact with our searchers even miles away through, through uh, rough terrain. Uh, we've got a team that helps us with mission planning and operations at the, the headquarters and some four by four teams as well. And then through the state, if we need more resources, it's just a phone call away. If I call our local uh, emergency operations center and say, hey, I need more people, or I need more dogs, they will find another team that can come assist with that. Um, we also have the ability to use helicopters from the Coast Guard and the Navy, and then some other resources for digging into cell phone histories and things like that um, from, from the uh, Department of Defense. So SAR has its limitations. It's not the, it's not the solution for all, all missing persons. Uh, in, in order to get started, in order for our civilians to come to a mission, we have to have a mission number and that's granted by the state. 
Uh, our volunteers are not law enforcement. Um, they might have a lot of them are, or some of them are retired or former law enforcement, but they have no authority to detain people. And that I'll kind of touch on that later as we get back to it. But um, if someone walks away from a volunteer searcher, they can't stop them. And that's, uh, and we'll, we'll tie that in later. Uh, also, our searchers are, are not, again, not law enforcement. They're not armed. Uh, they have the ability to protect themselves to some degree, but they're just, they're volunteer citizens, uh, just like our neighbors and our, our friends uh, who aren't law enforcement. So I will not send my searchers out looking for someone who's suicidal, uh, especially if they're homicidal as well. They don't help us for searches for people who are wanted on criminal charges. And a lot of times uh, we won't use our search and rescue for people who choose to be gone and can make that decision themselves. And that's kind of where the crux of this kind of comes down to. Uh, there's a range of responses to missing people, whether it's, hey, my roommate has been gone for a couple days. I don't know where he's at, but he left with a new girlfriend he, he met. Uh, that's gonna get a different response obviously than uh, my six-year-old child ran out the door into the woods and I haven't seen her for for three hours. And that's kind of the, the drastic range of responses we get in these missing persons calls and everything is gonna fit in between those. And so the, the amount of resources, uh, the amount of effort that the sheriff's office and our civilian partners will put to this is based on a range of, a range of issues. And in the end, a decision to use SAR is made by the supervisor on scene uh, or, or a SAR coordinator. So initially, what to expect? Uh, the primary job of the initial responding deputy is to obtain information. And I see it occasionally when we get a call of a missing person, especially if it's a more critical, urgent search this person needs to be found to be safe uh, i've i've got to the house to talk to the loved ones and their initial statement is why aren't you out looking for them and i and it's it, it's it's difficult to see someone who could be used as a resource to go look uh, but it's essential to obtain information because that information helps us really guide the search uh, and without that um, we can search a lot of areas, but not really get to the point of where we need to be looking. So it's also used to determine the urgency. Again, it's a, it's a range of responses. Um, and if we don't have that information, we're not gonna be able to determine what the urgency is. And we're gonna have a lot of questions. Uh, so if you bring up those, one of the two of those, uh, those forms I can talk about, that real quick. So this is kind of a general checklist that I've kind of put together using some other information. And there's checklists for missing, different checklists all over that we can kind of use for resources. Uh, but it's kind of, what to do when a patrol officer who might not be versed in search and rescue arrives on a missing person call. So I just kind of want to go over, oops, I can't scroll, <laughs> scroll. Just kind of the, some of the basic information. So obviously we need who they are, what they look like, um, what are we going to be searching for? But also we get to go close or not, sorry, we need to determine what their what their abilities are, uh, any disabilities, any medical conditions that might increase that urgency, and what their mindset is, and how they're really going to respond if the police are looking for them. And so don't be frustrated if we have a lot of questions. And the purpose of that is to narrow down our search and to help determine what resources we need. 
and actually the the for the as the on-scene supervisor these things that um these questions that they're asking are going to really determine whether or not i even have search and rescue come out if i'm the if the person um making that decision it may be uh seem fairly straightforward and simple when a six-year-old uh, child is missing um right everybody knows that's all hands on deck to find the kid where it gets more complicated is um i have a a person who is an adult of adult age whether it be 18 or, or 50 and then you essentially have to convince me or the search and rescue of the deputy is why this this adult needs us to come look for them so you need to provide us with that information and if it's just oh well they've been gone for an hour you can see where that skepticism rises in us i'm like well that so what that doesn't mean anything to me it's up to the loved one the family or the caretaker guardian to fill in those gaps to make me make a, 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 an informed decision because absent all these factors and all these things that make it me want to pull out get a SAR number and pull 50 people to come and look for your family member, I, I need to know some information, right? And go look for them right now, uh, do your job, those types of things that we hear, does, it doesn't help me make a decision. Although I understand your frustration level, it's a needle in a haystack. I have to start somewhere, especially when we were up north and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of acres of timber, well, I have to start somewhere. So there's just a bunch of information that I need to gather, the deputy needs to gather on the front end so I can make the best decision for everybody. Because just because it's an emergent situation for me or for you or the, whoever's calling in 911 doesn't make it an emergent situation for the sheriff's office or for us. You tell me they've been gone five minutes. Well, that may be a really big deal because they never do it, or it may not be. But I don't know that because I don't know this person. So be prepared to answer a bunch of questions and get specific about diagnosis, level of, um, you know, how high functioning or low function they are. Are they verbal, nonverbal? Um, are they going to hide from law enforcement? All these things around this form are super important to us. And it's not, it takes a while to get all this information. So if you bring up the, the next form, I'll just speak on this, this next form briefly. <clears throat> So this is a questionnaire that some organizations use uh, once they've determined that, this, that there's a need for a search and rescue mission. And as you can see, this page, this form is 12 pages, 12 pages long. And just thinking about all the time it would take to fill out this. So this is the information if we really have a search and rescue mission where your loved one is is gone and it's a critical search to find them um that it's a, a life and death threat uh it's a lot of questions and we may not use every single one of these pages or some of this might not apply but just gives an idea of what to kind of expect uh, when that investigating deputy or the SAR coordinator comes and and wants to get information And if you're if you're with some if you have a guardian or you know somebody that is a frequent uh maybe a frequent person who disappears having some of this stuff preloaded doesn't hurt right you can grab this form um a lot of it isn't going to change leave the parts blank like what they're wearing when they were last seen all of those things can be left blank because we know that's going to change but if you have this filled out on the front end name, date of birth, all those things that you may or may not know, it's going to expedite the situation later. For us, you're going to be like, well, I have this filled, this filled out here. I have all of these things that I know about this person. And then you fill in um, when they were last seen and all the other information that they look for. You don't have to worry yourself or, or about all this stuff that you already have uh, filled out. It just help. it would help expedite um, so what we're trying to do. I saw a couple of questions on there. Uh, this form, uh, Brenda, you can provide it to the people who are in this uh, in this meeting, I'm assuming. Um, another question was, how do they get the form to us? Uh, 
when someone goes missing, we will come to you. Uh, it may start as a phone call uh, with questions we ask, but we will we will come to you and we will get that information. We might not. I guarantee a, a patrol deputy is not going to bring a missing person uh, form like this, but they'll ask similar questions to the ones that are on that. And if we get into a search and rescue mission, we might have someone else come to ask more questions to help really direct that search and rescue mission to help us find your loved one more efficiently. I had a comment. Um, are you able to read at least a few of those perhaps for people that are not able to read it? And then I and we just had another comment in the chat that said, just to clarify, if they want to pre-fill out the form, do they keep it then until SAR shows up? SAR shows up. Yes, yeah. Something you can have on hand. It doesn't even have to be this form, just all the important information about your loved one or the person that, that potentially has a risk of going missing. Uh, the health issues, uh, disability, disabilities, um, their ability to communicate. Uh, if they're, uh, I've had some, some training in behaviors of uh, people with dementia and Alzheimer's and, and uh, autism and what they're attracted to. Uh, a lot of a lot of the, the lost people I've I've found before, especially if they're autistic, might be attracted to horses, and that would be good to know because that could request our horse team to come. Uh, but they might not be communicative with with people, but they might be attracted to horses. Um, issues with with dangers or fears anything like that which might help steer us a little better when we're when we're responding to these calls and if you can think about those things when you're clear-headed and not um super emotional about that person being gone because they're gone you it you think about just using that for an example right he he or she really loves horses for us when we're looking for a starting point we're like Oh, we know there's a there's an arena right over at you know three blocks down. Let's start there and, and do that. You're probably not going to think about those little things that could help us when you're under duress. So if you can do that while you're clear-minded and be like, oh yeah, these would be some probable places that I would start to look for so and so because I found them there before. They really like this. Um, it gives us some place to start because otherwise we're we're just we're, you know, we're just starting out in the big world to try to find somebody who may be gone for five minutes or five hours, 12 hours, because you went to bed and they were there and 10 hours later you woke up and they weren't. So you really have no idea how long that, that person has been gone. So at two miles an hour or whatever, somebody can drive, uh, walk two, two and a half, uh, 10 hours, they can get a long way, you know? So yeah, something to hold on to. I guess the point was, the things that you can pre-fill out while you're you're calm uh, that might help us later. I think it's probably smart to do if you say, have somebody who's um, maybe chronically um, missing or or has a tendency to to walk off. Perfect. Thank you. Um, this other comment says, "I feel like this info would be good to, for law enforcement to know about, even if the person is not missing." Besides Smart 911, do you know of any other method for people to share this info with dispatch? Mm, I think uh, Smart, I don't even know that. I know of Smart 911, I don't know that much about it, but I don't think there's really any other programs no. through Cressa to front load some of that information other than Smart 911. I really, I really don't. We don't hold like a we don't have a database of, of chronic missing people or, or um, chronic uh, runners or things. It's more informal for us. We have boards where like, hey, so-and-so has been walking off lately and we'll put it up on the board. So everybody that works that area kind of knows that. Um, but that, that uh, program through 911 is really the only one that I know of. We used to do um, there was a couple other ones for tracking that just kind of fell by the wayside. We really don't do them anymore. So, and a lot of it's because there's certain laws requiring 
regarding public disclosure and what information we can legally keep in a database if it's not uh, criminal justice related. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that's the reason why probably some of those databases have fallen away. I had one comment to that. I live rurally and um, so probably four or five miles away from the police department out here. And I have gone there before and asked about my son, particularly when he was younger and um, more of a runner and wanted to do something in there. It was more of an informal record, probably for those reasons that you just stated because um, privacy or whatever, but uh, my thought was, would it be helpful in Vancouver or to introduce yourselves or maybe you wouldn't to outstations in some of those areas that might be closer to your home or not so much? Yeah. I, I, so if you move into an area and you know, you know, you're going to have um, search needs or you're, you know, um, you're, you're guarding to somebody who is going to inevitably have police contact. And you know this because it's happened before. Um, they walk off once a week. I would say it would behoove you to be like, hey, I'm so-and-so. This is a picture of so-and-so. If you could just put it out in briefing, he's going to go missing once a week. And, and we try locking doors or whatever that case may be. If you know this is going to happen, it can't hurt to let him know, hey, this is Steve. And he he's he's a chronic disappearing act and and so when he goes missing you guys may be aware or if you see him about town he shouldn't be out there by himself you know and, and we have people do that usually it, it has a tendency to be younger people um uh that have children that we know we're going to run across they'll come in and be like hey this is he's been acting up lately you're probably going to have contact and it may not be that great um so I, I saw somebody said, hey, how, how would you, how do they prefer you, you um, do that? I mean, personally, I, if you live in a smaller town, um, I, I would just go to the police station. Um, for us, like the, um, a lot of times we kick that relationship off because we get a call by, by 911. And then that, then form a party goes, hey, you're going to know my name by the end of the month because you're probably going to be here quite a bit. So. It just dep really depends on the size of the agency. When you have a hundred people on patrol, um, it, it's you, you're not going to get that personal service that you would if you were with a smaller department, simply because you never know who you're going to get. Um, again, we we form those relationships up a lot of, through necessity, just by meeting people over and over again. Unfortunately. But we do have, for us, it's a board, we'll put them up and, and we have pictures of kids up um, in our briefing room that say who they are and what they like and they hate in noise or, or whatever. And those are for the people that we, we see frequently. Perfect, thank you. So can we go back to the PowerPoint and we'll, we'll finish that and then we'll stop and ask some questions about the search and rescue aspect before we move into the next, next area. So like we talked about, uh, it's a range of responses based on the information that we receive. Uh, is this immediate life and death situation? Uh, or do they have the physical ability to survive hours, days, in whatever condition uh, it is? Is it urgent but not life-threatening? Uh, an example of that was someone with some risk factors, uh, but they're able to, to self-care or the weather at that time uh, is warm and comfortable and it's not gonna be something where they get hypothermic overnight. And then at the other end of the scale is the, the non-urgent, somebody who's purposefully gone um, and has the ability to make that decision. And we have no authority to, to make them come home. Um, and that's a lot of, a lot of these contacts end up somewhere between the non-urgent and the urgent area. And these are just these are just titles that I put on this slide. So don't think there's actual categories that we we fit people into, uh, but it's it's a range. And I just wanted to kind of kind of point that out. 
So when we, we're asking some of these questions, it's kind of determined that urgency and that mindset and what they're, what, what the person, if we did contact them, how they would respond uh, if we wanted to, if we tried to get them to go home. So just a conclusion, uh, this is all the stuff we kind of covered uh, on that. So we can, we can go through this and then we can get to uh, some questions if anybody has any questions. I don't know, we can't really, I can pop that chat up. Uh, Katrina, but it's probably easier if you can relay them because it's kind of difficult. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, I'm a special ed teacher in Washington and teach life skills. So my students are significantly impacted. And um, one of the things I've thought about is like, it's hard for them to have a lot of communication opportunities and abilities to respond. But one of the things I've tried to tell them is say I have an IEP. Um, and I don't know if that's meaningful for law enforcement or not, but like some of my students have a hard time remembering their first name or their last name, right. um, phone numbers. And um, I also have some students that have like autism, significant autism. And so they pre present as someone who's deeply impacted, but not sure necessarily why. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering what things I could be helping my students and their families um, practice. Well, I mean, for us, again, we see that, that full range. So um, obviously people who are either nonverbal, they can't give you names, they can't give you um, addresses, some of that stuff. When you're starting at zero for us, um, and trying to place somebody, um, a lot of times rely on, we, we, we only know where they go because we've dealt with them before, but, but if it's new, uh, I'd say any IDs that they can carry, um, bracelets, any of that stuff really helps us depending on their level. Now, if they can tell us those things and where they live, not that it's not that big a deal. But again, when, you, when you're us and this range is all the way from, they give us no information to their they're showing like this person has no issues. Um, it's really, it's difficult, right? Because, you know, I'm talking to them and just like I would be talking to anybody and I'm not picking up anything, right? And I'm just like, hey, how are you? And so uh, we may not do anything with it or not even think that this person's in any kind of trouble at all, depending on the circumstances. If I see him walking down the road, even if it's midnight, People do it all the time. I'm not going to necessarily stop and be like, "Hey, are you okay?" Um, because it just, it's just frequent. So, but I would say it's much more important for those who can't give you basic information: who you are, how old you are, where you live, a phone number, to have something like that about them um, all all the time. Because if if it's a wallet and they and they're someone who has a tendency to wander off in the middle of the night, that really doesn't do us any good, right? They're in pajamas or whatever we see them. Obviously, we're going to pick up on that and know they're in need of some help. But um, yeah, it, it is hard. I think another thing for, for families um, of your students is to have a, have a plan, have information prepped ahead of time that they can easily give to law enforcement. Uh, that might be more impactful for us than them trying to uh, prepare their loved ones for interacting with with the police, and some of that, uh, some of that's just familiarity and what they what they hear and experience about the the police. And, um, mm -hmm. Without without school resources, as many school resource officers anymore, they don't have that face to face. They don't see that relationship. So the information they get in law enforcement might come from. Uh, TV or news or, or sources that might portray us in a different manner than uh, what reality Well, is. one of the things I've had my students do is we practice, like, um, tell me who you are. And so I say, that's your prompt to get your ID out. Yeah. And then yeah. for graduation, we've been, get, I've been buying them care bracelets, kind of like a medical alert bracelet, but they're attractive. 
and they make necklaces and bracelets. And so that's my graduation gift to them. Yeah, I think it's, so those, are, those are good ideas. Great idea, actually. Um, okay, thank you. Yep. There's two great questions in uh, the chat. Um, to Trina, I'll go ahead and let you do yours. <laughs> Yeah, so um, along the lines that you were saying before, so I was told that law enforcement kept track of homes with people with behaviors, disabilities, um, once they've made at least one house call. So if they've called the police before, I've been told that you guys keep record of that. Um, so if, is that the individual's name that you keep record of and their behaviors, disabilities, or is it just associated with the home's address? So, for example, yeah, if you saw an individual in the community who was having a behavior, would you know that individual's behaviors because of your system, or are they not connected? So the, there's a couple ways we can look at this. Each time we respond to a call, that call is associated with an address or an intersection or, or a place. Um, and when we return to that place, we can search that by that location. And that's good for several years after the initial call. So for example, Walmart and Hazeldell has a lot of premise history because that, gen that store generates a lot of calls. And each call, the information in the call is determined by what information is provided to the dispatcher by the caller. Um, if someone's name is in the call, they run it through uh, federal background, uh, federal ID check, then that person's name will be in the call. Any vehicles that we run will be in the call. But any notes that are in that call are really up to the deputy that responds. And sometimes uh, we don't put any notes in a call when we, when we clear it and when we're done with it. Sometimes we put extensive notes. It all depends on the situation. Uh, ideally, each time we dealt with someone who's a frequent uh, missing person, there'd be a lot of information in that premise history that we could access. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, we will not put information about people's uh, disabilities uh, or personal information like that in the notes of a call because all that stuff is public record. And it, it typically will be, um, will be marked out if someone requests that record. Um, but there's a chance, and we don't want to risk that and because there's, there's HIPAA laws that we have to follow as well. Yeah, generally those call log notes are going to be more, um, just more general, like, if, and every now and again, um, we'll just generate a, a police report as an informational, because we're like, hey, this is going to save us a bunch of time later, because the CAD system, the way it's set up is way easier, it picks up on addresses really, really well, and phone numbers pretty good. But individual people can be more difficult depending on how they their name was ran. Addresses are a slam dunk pretty much. If we can get them back to a house and pull that premise history, um, generally those names and all that stuff is going to be in those calls. The other stuff is a bit more difficult to, to track. So yeah, we we Cressa does track those by a, a address and some phone numbers. And then we have our internal, our internal police report system that if a report is generated, we will, that, that's searchable for us too. But even so, you guys, um, people don't understand too, um, the county uses a reporting system that Battleground, Camas, Washougal use. Yeah. The city of Vancouver, who is the largest agency, doesn't use our police reporting system. So we can't search theirs, they can't search ours. Now, if I, if I need that information, I have to contact one of their people or their uh, records just to have them check the system. So it used to be all interchangeable and we had one big system and it was fantastic, but then things got switched and we all decided we needed different things from programs. So we don't have the ability to just check some really cool system like on NCIS and like pull all this information. So it's limited to what's put in and then we can't even check Vancouver's. We can, but we have to contact somebody from Vancouver to do it for us, so. Thank you. And yeah. I don't have to worry about sharing my screen anymore so I can go ahead and read the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so do you know of any resources that can develop safety plans for people who experience challenging behaviors such as elopement, 
and physical aggression? I I don't know any off the top of my head. Uh, I know some of the the why the why the why is a really good resource. Actually, the why is the primary resource, or um, or they're just a really good clearinghouse for that type of information because they have a list of all the other resources that can help develop safety plans. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I always usually start there. They're just such a great, uh, yes. The YMCA or the, the YWCA. Or the YWCA, both. But for us too, we, we, we sometimes, if we see something or recognize something, we'll just contact Adult Protective Services as well. And there again, you're not maybe necessarily reporting something, but if you contacted them and said, hey, I, I need a list of resources, they can email you it, send you it, or do, do whatever. Adult Protective Services is fantastic because they have a good clearinghouse for all those uh, resources. Great. All right. So at what point do you guys consider someone abusing the system? So for example, my children's mother kicks our 16 year old out, locks the door, then calls the police to file him as a runaway. She mm -hmm. does this once to twice a month. So much now that we've had repeat officers who've mentioned that they are getting frustrated with her. My 16 year old and 11 year old started their day to day with an officer visiting them at school due to a false missing re person report. It seems someone would tell her to stop. Slippery slope there. Right for us, um, we're not there the 24 hours a day to know the intricacies of that relationship uh, between the kids and her. Now we're certainly going to have that conversation about: Well, did you lock the child out? Do you need me to place that child with um, child protective services because you can't lock your kid out and then call him a runner? I mean, having those frank for me, how I do my job, I had that frank discussion. That the kid is not a runaway. You locked them out, and they're your responsibility until they're 18 years old. Now, if you don't want that responsibility, there are there are ways to go through the court. Um, but in this state, you only have three. You either take care of your child, they go to child protective services for placement, or that child is emancipated. And I don't think there's any other way to deal with people who are under 18. That's it. But at the same time, we have a responsibility and a liability to take that runaway report. Um, and typically, almost all the time, we will. Uh, just because it's it, the one time that we don't is the time that something is going to happen. And it's going to come back on us for not taking that. I mean, honestly, if you have kids who are, are chronically running and they are staying out, I mean, this is a little different than um, a mother locking that person out. Um, they're, they're running a higher risk of being uh, victimized, right? Just because they're young, they're, they're out on the streets where they, they don't have protection. And there's absolutely people out there that are looking to, to um, exploit that. So from a law enforcement standpoint, it's easy. We want to find that kid. I don't care why they left. I mean, I do, but my main goal is to find that, that child. And sometimes we want to find them more than the parent does. And it's apparent when you meet their, the people that are calling them in. They make zero effort to find them. Um, and they just, want, they just want you to go do whatever. Well, if we don't have a starting point, we don't go look for runaways we we just don't because where would you start when a 16 year old leaves with a car i mean we'll put the, the plate in the system but if you're not going to make effort to go check family or friends or you're not even calling your own child um that that shows me how worried you are about your, your kid you probably know they're at a friend's house and that, that that's okay i'd be more than happy to go check that friend's house but I don't have, I only have the information that you give to me. I'm only, I'm only as good as the information that the parent gives. So I know we kind of strayed off there a little bit, but. It looks like Alex, do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to tell you something briefly that happened to me a while back. I was um, uh, minding my own business, walking or uh, 
excuse me, not walking, sorry, sitting down waiting for the bus. This was way pre-COVID. Um, and some officer came up to me and I uh, was a little bit scared um, about what was happening there or whatever. I was minding my own business, looking down at my cell phone, looking up briefly, waiting for the bus to come to take me to wherever I was going. And I uh, communicated with the officer. He asked me a couple of questions, asked me for my ID. I showed him my ID or whatever. And then, then that was that. I just wanted to state that. Yeah, I mean, it's possible they had a, uh, a call in that area and, and had a reason that they needed to identify you. I, I, I don't know. I mean, every situation could be so different, Alex. It's kind of hard to, to say why they would contact you. All right, and then there's another question. So similar question. If a, an adult has an interest in IE and keeps calling and IE keeps responding, would Office would staff who are not guardian be able to step in and also call dispatch and say it, it is not serious, so don't come. Yeah, it, ha it happens. It happens frequently. Uh, we have some people that call dispatch multiple times a day, every day, for the same same incident or same uh, thing that they're experiencing that may not be reality. And generally, after a while. Uh, we will just take those calls for information and not respond. So we don't respond to every call that comes in. Um, and feel free if, if someone is calling and there's a, a guardian or parent that can provide more information that can help direct that response, whether it's needed, something else is needed or it, no response is needed at all, feel free to call and give that information as well. Yeah. If, it, and it sometimes depends on what the initial caller is alleging. If they're alleging something serious or a, a crime, and then somebody else calls and says, oh, no, you don't need to come, we're probably going to show up, you know, just to make sure everything is, is okay. But we do, again, like Scott said, we have some people that we know, we've tried to hook them up with services, we know they have um, mental health issues. Um, and a, a brother or sister will call and say, hey, she's having an, an issue right now. And we, we know these people because we have a, a, a relationship with them through literally some five, 10 years of knowing, trying to give them services and then just not wanting it, you, you, um, that we know whatever they're calling in about is not true, <laughs> just because we, we just know it's not. We we've, we've did due diligence and checked it before and, and the things that are... Um, alleged that are occurring or not. So if we hear from another family member, which we do we'll say, hey, it's there's nobody in the attic, um, you know, mom's mom's got dementia or, or have, it, it does happen. So a couple questions came up. It doesn't have to be a, a, a guardian or a, a parent. If someone else can provide more information or clear information to dispatch, feel free to make that, that call uh, as well. And it, a lot of times, uh, that will clarify the situation or provide us more information to, to help dictate our response. Uh, and I missed the last one that just came up. So what services do you try to get these individuals connected to? So at first we try to re have, uh, if it's something that doesn't meet a police response criteria, uh, we'll try to have a uh, crisis response team call in, make that initial phone call to help determine where that can be steered, which direction that can be steered. Uh, but also, if a phone call doesn't work, they're not answering their phone. A lot of times the crisis response team or mobile crisis will come out in person and ask us to come, uh, one of us to come with them to help facilitate that contact to help better determine how they can help that person. Uh, and as far as other resources, uh, a lot of times uh, we'll get adult protective services involved or if it's a, a minor child protective services. Columbia River Mental Health gets a lot as a clearinghouse for a lot of that stuff. And so they can get that information from crisis. And um, it, I mean, obviously it depends on what the issue is that they're having is kind of which, which, air, which way we steer that, right? Or who, who, we, who we hook them up with or who we try to hook them up with. 
All right, so what if police and CPS have been involved several times and mom keeps locking kiddos out or tells police he threatened her? Police treat kid like he is a troublemaker and assume mom is telling the truth. Makes kiddo not trust cops or the system. Yeah, I would agree, but I don't have a crystal ball, right? And in the end, I make a judgment call on what the kid is telling me and what the mother is telling me. Uh, and I, and I, I don't necessarily believe a parent just because they're the parent, but I would be lying if I didn't tell you it gives me some more weight, right? I, I would not be doing my job if I didn't listen more to a parent who's telling me and a kid's exhibiting signs that they're just being obstinate. You know, no, no allegations of abuse, just, just not showing, you know, just running. Um, so, I mean, clear as a kid that's asking the questions, but you're, you're talking about chronic issues that really I could only give you a, a, a good answer on if I looked at him individually, right? I can't give you a, an all encompassing answer about a mom who continues to uh, lock a 16 year old out, how I would deal with it. He may deal with it differently. Um, I don't know, because there's too many intricacies in there for me to say this all the time or that all the time. But one thing we can, if that happens, is an issue and I know there's solutions, that's when getting family court involved and getting a judge to to change living situations, uh, that's where that that plays into all this. Or again, hooking, hooking them up with counseling, like, hey, you guys, you know, at 16, the, the whole, you're, 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 you're a big enough person there's no more, you know, sitting you in the corner or doing some of those things. This needs to be a discussion about how, how you're going to live here and how this we're going to make this work, you know. And sometimes parents and kids can't do that themselves. They need a facilitator, and that's counseling. You know, I, I'm not a counselor. I'm, I'm, a, I'm the sheriff's office, so I do my best to hook them up. And if I see it chronically, I'm like, hey, you guys, this isn't working. We're here way too much you're not looking for answers. The kid's not looking for answers. You guys need to come together and figure something out because clearly this isn't cutting it between the two of you. So again, I, um, you're talking about a specific issue that I'd, I'd have to really experience and, and know the ins and outs of. Okay, so I did have a question. So um, I've worked with a lot of families who have kiddos that have aggressive behaviors mm -hmm. and the parents do not want to call the police. Um, I've heard this so many times uh, because they're terrified of the police and how the police will handle the situation. There's again, like you said, we have the news to watch, which has lots of horror stories of individuals with disabilities. I didn't know if you could kind of tell me things that I could share with families to reassure them that maybe calling the police is the best options. So if there's training you guys are currently involved in or any other things that I can share with families. Well, I, I would start with um, what are you trying to accomplish by calling the police? Because what we aren't, we're not the enforcers of your house rules, right? That That's not what we do. I'm not there to parent your child. That's your job. What we will do if a crime has occurred, we will take somebody to jail. We'll write criminal reports. We'll hook you up with services if you need services. But many times what we get is a phone call from a parent to come and, for lack of a better term, threaten child into acting appropriately. But that's, that's a horrible thing. And that's why we've gotten into the position that we're in now. I am not your, uh, your heavy hand. I'm there to help you if a crime occurs or if you need hooked up with services. Um, and it starts at a young age, right? Where we were teaching kids, oh, that if you do something, if you don't mind mom, there's the police. Well, that's not true. I'm actually a good person. You commit a crime, I might be there to and, and deal with you that way. But when you have a violent kid, here's what they want you to do in those situations is they, they change the law to at least make it mandatory arrest at 18 now, right? We don't have to arrest them at 16 like we used to. So we have options. But those options are limited. Those options are, I'll come in there and I'll, I'll keep the peace, right? If that's what we need to do for the, for the night. If a crime has occurred and somebody has been assaulted, and that includes the parent or, or the child, um, somebody might go to jail. So a lot of times that's what they're scared of because we get lied to regularly. And if you go there and I have enough probable cause to arrest parent or child, 
that's going to happen most likely. So that's what they're scared of. They want us to go and make things better without the repercussions of what the law require of us. So I don't know how to fix that. Um, I would say a lot of times they're, they're using that as an excuse that they're scared of the police when they've never experienced a reason to be, right? That, and the reality is if you have a child that's that violent that you need to call the police, um, maybe you need to, maybe that's what you have to do to, to get hooked up to a higher level of service, right? That, I mean, all of us is, um, if it gets to that point where you're chronically calling the police or need to, you have a very significant issue in your house because every normal house has its ups and downs. They have arguments, they have all these things, but that stuff certainly doesn't happen on a weekly and daily basis to the point where you think you need to call the police, right? That's, that would be abnormal. So, um, well, I, I, would, I, I, I would agree with that, uh, in a hopeful world of people who don't experience disability, but unfortunately we're finding it to be quite common, especially as, as our, I'm sorry, as our boys get bigger and stronger absolutely. and, um, moms get smaller and older and it's actually becoming quite a, an issue with a lot of our moms, mm -hmm. particularly. Um, some fathers also, of course. Yeah. I wondered if you, if is that a time where we could circle back? Can we call and ask for a crisis response team and not the police? And maybe like keep mom safe, but nobody has to go to jail or... Yeah, and it's not a, it's not an all or nothing, right? And we 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 see it, right? Where again, they're just too they're grown adults, then there's no there's no physical controlling of that person, right? And then if they're if they have a dis, the type of disability uh, is, makes them more a little prone to violence, um, work we're, we're just limited to how we can deal with that. Is what I'm saying is I, I would much prefer it stay in the crisis realm, right? And have someone from crisis respond and talk through the issue um, without there being any, any problems. But we've also seen the guardian, caregiver, parent be hurt extremely bad by child, like when it rises to that level. And that's the, I guess, not being in that house every day. That's where I don't know how, how heavily that behavior has escalated on, on that person's part. And it's a judgment call on the guardian. But again, you're right. I mean, this moms, dads, I don't care if you're bigger or smaller, trying to control a, a grown person physically is not easy. And it often, it often looks violent, right? That, and that's where, when we step in, in order to control a grown man, that's difficult to do and it's not pretty. So do we want to do it? Absolutely not. Um, but there's times when it, it that is the only solution. And, and that's where it gets really difficult. There's families that we've known for years and years when that young kid starts to get larger and we're like, you guys, this isn't gonna work forever. It works now that you're able to hold them down and calm them down, but the person's a year away from that not working anymore. And then it's like, I don't have the skill set to, to deal with that. that and, and we've, on the on the worst case scenario, we've seen the the, the kids just not able to be there anymore, need a higher level of care on, on the worst end. And I've seen it, he's seen it, where we've they've tried to keep them in the home and it's just became a, a dangerous situation that we're just not able to deal with, so. Yes, we're seeing it too often. Um, there's another question and then probably I should let you move on to your next segment, but uh, does anyone know of any de-escalation de training or crisis management training for families? So I can speak to a tiny bit of that. I think it was two years ago that Peace offered oh. one for our families and it was, and it actually was um, pretty robust and it included physical, um, safe, more safety restraints for the parent to at least get out of the crisis moment. But I acknowledge that was a while ago. So it's probably time and I'm hoping that maybe um, Sheriff's Office has some other ideas. Yeah, again, I think, um, do you know? I, I, do, I don't know anything for, for families. I, I know that um, 
the, all the training that's available to us, um, but that's it's not to the general public and it's kind of tailored for the job specific job that we we do, um, but I don't know any specifically for families. Again, usually that kind of stuff comes up through the counseling process, right? Where they, they've gone and then they've been introduced to some further resources by counselors or um, Catholic so social services. There's a really good um, option for people um, to the point where they'll, if the kid has a caseworker, they're just boom, they're on it. They'll be having problems and they'll, they'll show up many times. Catholic social services will show up prior in lieu of us. They'll call and be like, hey, I'm here now. I've de-escalated so-and-so and we're good. And we're like, awesome. That That's perfect. We would much rather see that. But that's for people who have a pretty intensive um, therapy, I guess, for lack of a better term, where they have a pretty tight relationship with the counselor and that person's really on call for you know them and, and a few clients. They have that luxury, I guess, of making that phone call and having somebody at the house. I just want to say before we end this part of kind of transitioning from search and rescue to the, the criminal uh, potential criminal side of things, uh, I got to get going. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, hope that information that we provided will help help your families. Oh, it was very helpful. I'm happy you came. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you. Scott. Thank you. But I'm here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thanks, Scott. Katrina, was that your question there? Yeah. yeah. So um, first, Adrian was asking, is that WISE that you were referring to? Who's it what? WISE. I don't know if you're familiar with WISE. No. Okay. Um, so yeah, my question was just back to the training portion. So is there mandatory training for police officers regarding working with people with disabilities? You yeah, I think the state the state sent it out this year, and then it's um, I mean, but it is mandated. All right, Janelle, did you have something, real quick? Oh, I was just thinking, um, at talking to your DDA worker uh, and maybe the director of special ed in your students district and just saying this is a need we have and I'm sure that they and push it a little bit I assume that they would help develop some kind of training because they train educational staff and that same um, training would be helpful for families and um, that should be part of what they offer for in-district families so I push for that in DDA. That's a great yeah, idea. I guess the schools are a great resource too. It's something I've kind of neglected to say, but starting in your school can't, I mean, I, they could at least start you in the right direction, right? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. All right, and I was just responding to Adrian. Okay. So... Anything else, question-wise? I think we're good if you want to move on to the, your next yeah. section. So we'll talk about, um, and again, this is, we'll talk about what happens if your, um, your, loved one or the person you're guarding for um, gets um, arrested for, um, well, it's a couple different different um, ways that can go. Uh, and I'll, I guess for lack of better terms, you guys, I'll just use guardian and, and, and realizing that can be parent or um, it can be a, a myriad of relationship. Anybody, it's different when they live, to, when you guys live together, right? As guardian and parent or um, child and parent, different laws, right? Domestic violence in the state of Washington is defined by your uh, relationship more so than your living status. Uh, I have, if you have children, you don't live together but you get in a physical altercation with your children, even though you're not living together, you're not co cohabitants, you still are, it's considered domestic violence because of your relationship, right? Mother, daughter. So realize that when those things happen and a physical assault occurs, 
we are triggered and mandated by law to make arrests if we have probable cause to do so in a, um, in a person who's 18 or over. It used to be 16 and we would take juveniles to juvenile detention and they would just turn around and call the parents to pick them up and it somebody smart finally realized this is silly and it's not working and it's, this isn't the place for this child to be. So now it, it basically um, you have, not that we don't take juveniles to, to juvenile detention when they need it, but we're not necessarily mandated to. But if you have an adult um, person you're a guardian for and you live together, you are in that relationship strictly because you're under the same household. So when an assault occurs or certain domestic violence crimes um, occur, we're, we're required to make an arrest if there's probable cause. Does that make sense? Okay, so we'll, we'll start there. So your, uh, your person has been arrested for just say an assault for um, domestic violence, right? A simple assault. Um, they're gonna get taken to jail if it's within the four hour mandatory um, arrest window. So that person goes to jail and they are an adult, they're gonna go to uh, the Clark County Correctional Facility, or if they're a juvenile, they're gonna go to JDH. Juveniles are different. The parent or guardian can expect a phone call from juvenile detention um, and be a really much more updated on what's going on with their uh, their child than a person who's 18. At 18, the law presumes you are an adult and your business is your business. So if you call there and looking for information on somebody, just as if you or I um, wouldn't want our information aired, they're not going to do that for that person. And then they're, so realize you may be their legal guardian, but that doesn't mean anything to the, the criminal justice system initially. Um, now that may come up later after in, when you get in front of a judge and say, listen, your honor, this person um, has these developmental disabilities and they only function at such and such a level or, um, you know, but those are those are decisions that are made by doctors and judges, not at our level. Like I'm not I don't make although we take all the, the information into uh, into account. I don't make the decision on whether a person's competent enough to commit a crime or not. That's done by a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, um, and after it being evaluated. My job um, is, is to not do that, right? So it, it, the person could swear all day, oh, they don't know what they're doing, but if I have probable cause for a crime and, and they've committed a crime, I have to take that person to jail in domestic violence situation. Now, do we use common sense? Absolutely, we use common sense, right? I can tell by talking to somebody where they're at mentally, um, but just know there are times when we are, uh, our hands are tied. Go ahead, Brenda. I wanted to just, there's a question in the chat that wanted you to define probable cause before you go much it's further. The minimum amount of knowledge that a, an officer needs to make an arrest. For me, it is, we know that I, I've established that a crime has been committed and that there's more likely than not that that person in particular has committed that crime. So I have to start with a crime, right? And then the information that I've gathered throughout that call leads me to believe more than 51% that that, that person is a person who committed that crime. Thank you. Yeah. So they go, they get booked in, and now um, mostly domestic violence is different. Um, they have to go see a judge. Um, so they'll see a judge usually that next day, um, and then the judge will either release them or keep them, depending on the severity of the crime, depending if they have a, an address to release to. Where's the hiccup? The hiccup is the person might not be able to take care of themselves so well. They probably don't have, may not have money. They might have somebody who controls their, their uh, funds, a payee. So they can't get a hotel. They can't go back to the house because the, the victim is at the house. So it's quite complicated. And I, I would dare tell you, it's not easy. And so the temptation is there to let that person back in. But that in and of itself is 
that person is committing a, another crime, right? They're, they're usually going to be violating a restraining order at that point. Um, and even talking to that person can be a violation of the restraining order. And the guardian is not going to be the one, it'll be the one who the restraining order is against. So just be aware of that. Now, hopefully the judge can take some of that stuff into consideration and, and make some arrangements. Um, and sometimes they don't find probable cause and everything's, you know, back, they'll just be released. Um, but realize you might not have that option. And so you may need to contact somebody else um, in the system to, to help take care of that person until the, the criminal matter can get sorted out. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's a question. What is the detention center called? Ours is just a Clark County Jail. Clark County, uh, well, it's either Clark County Juvenile Detention Center or just the Clark County Jail. Understanding that even that process that you said in just a few minutes, that especially if it's on a weekend, right? That could take a, a few days. So our yeah, judges, I mean, now still judges, in the judges come in and, and evaluate probable cause and stuff on the weekends now. They're legally obligated. They, they come in. But um, yeah, so that, I mean, the weekends can affect some things, but the court, they still come in and, and read cases every every day. So, I mean, they'll e they at least come in and evaluate for probable cause. So again, uh, that person may or may not be spending more time in jail depending on the crime that's occurred. And you're gonna have um, um, quite an uphill battle probably finding or getting information from the system about the person you're the guardian for without seeing the judge. And then just, I guess, as an overall, be realistic about timelines. Um, we understand it's a, it's a, when these events occur, it's a really big deal in your life. But the justice system is huge, and they have hundreds of cases a day. And um, it's just hard. Um, people want answers. They want them right away. And a lot of times, they just don't get them. So I would say be patient, um, but be diligent in your um efforts because the squeaky wheel really does get the grease for sure and if you're not getting answers that you think you need answers to um i would say be consistent but uh, there's a lot of things you guys that only a judge can do i mean, I mean we're not going to release information um, when you're talking about adults now the juveniles are a, a completely different um scenario so Okay. There's there's a bunch in the chat. I don't know what's just one. I think. Um, do you know when if someone has assaulted someone and is taken into jail, when a DCR will intervene and when they will not? Oh, what is it? Oh, I see. Um, DCR. I don't know what that is. I don't. I I didn't either. Adrian, can you clarify? Are you meaning do not? Yeah, like a designated crisis responder to evaluate if they should be on an ITA. Oh, so, yeah, those are that's jail. What was the question though? About like the if someone, yeah, if someone assaults somebody and so they're taken to jail, mm -hmm. like when do you know when like a DCR would intervene and when they wouldn't intervene? Yeah, and it, so a couple, it may happen early in the game if, uh, if the medical staff deems it necessary, if they're dealing with somebody with some pretty significant issues. If it's a little more hidden, that may be something that the judge um, orders at, at at one of the hearings. And I don't know exactly, um, you know, I, I don't work in the jail, but that's something that the jail or the courts would facilitate. <clears throat> All right. So the next question says, how can a restraining order be enforced? For example, there is a restraining order and husband keeps stalking mom and kids and videotaping them. Neighbors are starting to take pictures of him and calling police, but it isn't stopping him. There's no room in the jail to keep him. So you have two issues there. I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, I won't touch on the jail 
if it's a domestic violence crime, they will be kept in jail. Now, how long they'll be kept, that that's not, I can't tell you that. Um, so if we if there's an order in place and we have probable cause that the order has been violated, again, we're forced, we're mandated to arrest that person. That person will go to jail. Now, whether how long that person stays is up to the jail and up to a judge. So I will tell you generally now, the jail is at felony level holding. That domestic violence being the only, really the truly the only um, kind of outlier there and that DV crimes and certain, there's certain specific crimes that they're required to at least book them on, but that doesn't mean they have to keep them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a question earlier about if your loved one has been taken into custody and um, is on daily, at least, or even two or three times a day, is on medication. Mm -hmm. I hear it a lot that that is a frustration because it takes quite a bit of time before the person in custody is a, is evaluated for the medication and then and then allowed to take the medication because they can't take the medication into jail. So are you yeah. able to talk about that? Yeah, I think, and it, again, you guys, it's been a long time since I've worked in the jail, but think about it from a, um, from a, a care standpoint. Like they're going to be evaluated by a nurse in booking. There's a nurse in booking. So this person, say I come in and I say I'm on X, Y, and Z. I've been diagnosed with X, Y, and Z, and I need these medications. And they'll which you wouldn't be able to do probably if you have a disability. But sorry, go ahead. Depending on the level of your disability, right? I, I don't know. I mean, they're the full spectrum, right? Um. So then, from a from a um, from the standpoint of the medical staff. Would you err on the side of not giving or giving? Right? So therein is a difficulty, I think. And again, call my doctor. But but maybe I don't know my doctor, right? And so hopefully that with the medical staff, they can work through some of those issues and get those medications. But the reality is some of that stuff, if you miss it a day or two, you are in trouble, right? You're in back to back to square one. And so I think it's unrealistic to say there's going to be continuity in a significant number of medications, um, especially when they're not life and death medications, like I need insulin or I, whatever, or I'm going to go into diabetic coma and die. If it's um, some of those things where if I don't get it, it's going to be a gradual decline, um, or it's a, unfortunately a mental health uh, med where it's, it's not going to immediately be impactful to me, but I know that it's going to, I'm going to have to reset, hit the reset button on this whole thing again. And getting my meds just right was hard enough. So I don't know that there's a great, um, you know, I, I don't know how the jail handles that. Um, I, I can just tell you that it's, it's really difficult to be hard to allow somebody to bring their medications because you can't tell what it is, you really don't know, and you rely on that person to tell you, and people bring drugs into jail, or they try to bring illegal drugs into jail all the time, so yeah, I mean, I guess being realistic about um, the level of care in the jail in the immediate short term, um, you might not get some of the things that you're used to getting as regular as you're getting it. Especially again, like Brenda said, what if I'm having difficulty communicating that? Um, but hopefully, the the medical staff is recognized is able to recognize that. Hey, we're we're miss something's missing here, um, and so you know, contacting with that person is okay. Is it okay if I call your caregiver or your guardian? Yes, and then giving you that call to figure out okay what am I on or what are they on? What have they been diagnosed with? Again, without having to restart all of that, what's taken years and years of diagnosis and medication, um, uh, uh, experimenting with medication dosages and types, no one wants to reinvent that wheel, right? So why, why try to fix something that isn't broke? For sure. And then Adrian asked if there's any way a parent or guardian or staff can 
file the jail to provide records to speed up the process or to assist with the medication list. Yeah, um, I, would, I would think so. Again, I, I don't know for sure because I don't work in the jail, but that just makes sense to me, right? As I'm calling about someone I know you have in jail, they're, they're my person, they have these significant issues. How can I get you these records? I, I, that makes sense to me. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I dealt with something similar to this recently. And it's important, I think, for par or guardians or parents to remember that the jail staff, even if you are a guardian, will, they have to protect that privacy and they are not able to share anything, essentially. Mm -hmm. However, you can tell them pretty much anything you want. So I, if I were the, if it were my son, let's put it that way, I would share to whomever would listen anything that would make their stay his stay easier and frankly for him as well as the custody staff that's trying to support him right so but beyond that i understand that if i were to provide a medication list then the medical staff still has to go and confirm that on a medical uh, database of some sort to confirm that but then the other piece is Hmm, when's the last time he took it? Did he have it this morning? Did he mm -hmm. have it nine times this morning? I mean, so it's it just, of course, like um, you just said, don't expect it to be streamlined. Don't expect it, it to be given exactly like you would have given it at home. Unfortunately, it'll probably be off for a few days before it gets mm -hmm. um, set, even if you are the guardian and even if they are in contact or will take the time to contact your person's um, doctor, it will take longer than you think that it should. Mm -hmm. um, but as also, like you said, if it's not an immediate thing, they they will address those needs first. But um, there there is going to be some not only trauma from being in jail, I, I believe, but also then now their medication may have not been the same or even a generic versus a yeah for sure a name brand or or the right exact dosage so just that's just one more um layer of what could be the outcome of your person landing in custody is that about right you think yeah i mean um, you're you're right on it's super difficult and, and the more you kind of peel back the layers you start realizing how difficult that is, right? Well, then I have to verify that and verify this. And, and really you, you should have an obligation to do that, right? As a, as a medical person is like, okay, you're telling me all these things, but I probably need to hear from a doctor too that makes sure that we're doing this correctly because there's some danger there when you're, when you're distributing medication. I mean, you're responsible for that person. They're responsible for the security of that facility, right? They have this whole facility that they're trying to secure. And then all the little pieces that are in it, which is the people who are spending time there. And everybody's, um, you know, got pressing issues or, or, or trying to, it's a diversion of time, right? Or just uh, there's only so many people and so much time they can do to, um, uh, to help individuals out. And that's why, honestly, um, if they don't need to be there, we try hopefully the judge recognizes this person is needs a higher level of care that we just can't simply give them here they're not a danger to to whoever we need to get them out of the system but again that's not going to happen within 10 hours or you know for the most part it just doesn't happen as quick as a lot of times it should or we would want it to so all right alex do you want to probably finish us up go ahead I just wanted to ask if, if he, uh, not, not saying that I would ever want to be in law enforcement, but let's say um, I knew somebody that was in law enforcement. Do they have to live in the same state in order to work in the state that they're working in? No, we have, I mean, we're kind of interesting where we're at, right? That we live right next door to Oregon and we have lots of people live in Oregon. There are jurisdictions that require you to live within a certain geographic area because your response time needs to be within so much. Um, I don't see that here that much, um, but I'm, I'm from the Midwest and that was pretty commonplace for police and fire both that had to live within a certain uh, radius of their city. 
But here okay. we have people that live in Kalama and Longview and uh, over in, uh, you know, Beaverton area. They kind of come. Because I, I knew over. somebody that lived uh, in Clackamas yeah. area or whatever. And he was like, a, a, how do I explain this? Like a... Uh, a part-time hmm. person yeah, like a reserve or something maybe yeah yeah for the clark county sheriff's yeah. office yeah we don't have reserves anymore there were some law changes that made it extremely difficult but um yeah that it, it's pretty common actually i'd say probably a, uh, maybe a quarter of us a quarter of the people live over on the portland side maybe a little less than that but Harold was his name. You remember his last name? Rains. Okay, yeah. Yeah, he was here quite a while. Yeah. I think he did search and rescue too, as a matter of fact. He was my uh, boss. Okay. For the county. But he's since retired now. Oh, good. Anything else you guys can think of? It's, it's such a, it's a pretty huge, pretty broad su subject. I'm sorry I don't know more about the, the in custody stuff. I just, it's not really my specialty anymore. I recently ran across another uh, little piece of knowledge, I guess, that I wanted you to be able to uh, be the bearer of. But I think it's important to let our families know, right, that, um, so your person is in custody and say they have a seizure, which is also a little more common in our community. They are uh, not going to notify the guardian or parents if they end up, well, of that happening. And they are not going to notify the family if their loved one is taken into uh, um, the hospital. And they are not going to even allow your loved one to have phone contact with you for unless they're in custody in the hospital for three days. And so that to me is a mom is, is somewhat frightening, but I think it's important that maybe parents know that ahead of time because um, that seems, that would blows your mind unless you understand the whys. And I thought maybe you could talk, um, Tom, a tiny bit about the why. The why I understand is so you don't have grandma and grandpa and 17 cousins showing up at the, um, well, an inmate, right? He is yeah. still an inmate in the yeah. in in the hospital room. And then now you've got crowd control and you possibly are, you know, it, I understand why family members want to be there, but um, I also know that if, if it's a violent or offense and someone else, and it's not your person, but if it was somebody else, I understand mm -hmm. why you wouldn't want, you know, if it's a gang yeah, member, I mean, something it, else, the whole world to know that he's there. <laughs> so it truly boils down to a security issue, right? When we're, um, hospitals are an unsecure environment, right? And their, their sole purpose is to help people get better and, and fix people medically. So when we're there as, um, law enforcement or as um, detention officers, that's kind of putting a little, um, we try to be a fly on the wall there, right? They, they fully expect that we control that inmate without any, they don't want any issues for the rest of the people there that are trying to get better. And they want us to get the best care to that person who is in there from uh, the correctional facility. That's really hard when you're talking about um, a really unsecure environment coming from a walls that nobody gets in or out of for the most part to people coming in and out all the time. And so it's much easier to, to just say, to not differentiate between somebody who is violent, right? And there's people who would break them out of the, out of that hospital room if they could down to somebody who, you know, is, is in a correctional facility for a, a lesser crime. So you have protocols in place. Um, the three days, I don't know 
where that came from or why, but I can certainly tell you most of that stuff is just going to go right back to a security issue and not having the ability to secure that room with the one or two people that you got there. And then I've had it where tons of family are showing up and then things go wrong and it is a dangerous, scary place to be in. And the hospital doesn't like it, right? They're like, okay, we have patients trying to get better here and there's a bunch of issues going on. So yeah, I don't know. Again, the three-day thing, it would just be nice if, uh, yeah, we're right back to HIPAA and, and not telling people for, for legal reasons. The hospital's being totally separate from, from the sheriff's office or detention center, so. Yeah, it's security and thank you for, for summarizing that much better than I did because I think we don't think about that as um, we think of our loved ones generally and we think, oh, they're in the hospital, we need to spend the night and hold them and we can't do any of that and it's all because of security. Yeah, thank and we've had, we, we, we know that we've had violent encounters, we've had, yeah. you know, I've watched murderers and things where they're, they're very dangerous people and then trying to weigh getting them care when they're un uncuffed or unshackled, it, it can get really unsafe. It's, yeah. it's, you know, most people are pretty good because they want to be, they want to get better, but it can get, um, it's not easy. Thank you. Um, Certainly, we have a little bit more time for questions. If 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 people have questions they want to put in the chat or or turn their mic on and ask. Um, in the meantime, I wondered if we might have a moment to talk about. I think somebody wrote, was it four one one in the chat or something uh, to problem solve a tiny bit rather than yeah four one one rather than calling the police in the first place, because I know y'all don't necessarily want to arrest our folks, um, but we also don't want people getting hurt. So if, I don't know, do you have, is there a, um, you know, something else we could be doing or some? Well, I mean, it, it, it truly just depends on, on what's going on, right? I mean, we don't mind coming and, and as a county, and I think even as a state, um, I, and I don't know what 4, 411 is, that, um, I, I'm, that's unfamiliar to me. So if somebody knows more about that, then. Bernice, do you want to tell us? 411 is a Clark County hotline that you could call for resources. So like if you were to say, hey, I'm looking for, a facility for counseling for children they will pull that up and they can tell you where to go oh awesome just so, but like it's a old Clark school, county resource like old school 411 just straight information yeah pretty much <laughs> and, and I, I think we do a better job now the interesting part was for a long time we just didn't have it was an all or nothing proposition right we didn't have anywhere to go we didn't have where to take them except the hospital um, we don't have we don't have the facilities that we need. Unfortunately, there's millions and millions of dollars thrown at a problem that continues to not get solved. Um, and, and it's not going to happen overnight, but we're doing better. We're having these these teams that are able to respond and do the things that law enforcement has been doing for way too long that are not in our wheelhouse. We've, we've gotten really good at them through necessity, but. If you're in need of counseling, you don't call the police, you should call a counselor. They would be the best person for that job. Now, do we do it? We absolutely do it as an intermediary, but it'd be more per in a perfect world, someone just that, that has a higher knowledge base of that comes up and, and handles that situation. So- Well, I'm not saying in particular, just counseling is any resources. Yeah, for sure. You know, yeah, the banks. Anything like that, you can just dial four one one and say, yeah. "Hey, I need to know where the local food bank is." Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't. I don't. I can't believe I didn't know that, but I didn't know that. Yeah, I used to work for Emergency Shelter Clearinghouse, which is the hotline for the shelter okay. in Clark County, and we had access to pull up those resources. Um, it was really a lovely system to do that too. That's great. But, um, it's great to have a 
like dial O for an operator <laughs> kind of thing. But yeah, and and many of the like these crisis services for us are starting to come online twenty four hours a day. That for again forever, the big problem was. You can help me from 8 to 4.30. Well, that doesn't do me any good at 1 a.m. And we're a 24-hour-a-day business. And so well, start and to realize this is something that needs to be staffed all the time because people don't go into crisis or have these issues just during business hours. Get smarter about it and better about it. We're nowhere near where we need to be. I mean, I, I would like to see um, full a full-time, a person embedded with the sheriff's office to, to that that's all they do is is hit crisis calls well it's like the 988 number you know a lot of people can dial that now for mental health crisis except if you have a 503 area code it's going to show up that way to you know them so they're not going to know where you're at right so yeah, it's kind it's of a like, hiccup right there. Yeah, like a clearinghouse. And I know I just saw something about that the other day. They were talking about that with dispatch on some of these technical issues like that, that they're trying to remedy. And it's just difficult. Right. Because I'm like, can I change my, my voicemail instead of call 911, call 988? And they're like, well, not exactly. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still weird. You'll get in parts of the county that pick up over in, in Portland. So, I mean, it's just the way things get routed. And it's, right. you know. And there's a lot of nice 711 members too. But again, I think we're getting better at it. Um, everyone recognizes it. Certainly the, the police, the sheriff's office has recognized it forever. We've been dying for help. We're just like, please, this is not what we were meant to do. Um, and, you know, finally we're starting to get some traction. Alex, did you have a question or a comment? Um, I might have a question and slash a comment. I've tried to um, call the non, uh, uh, what's that thing called? Like the non-emergency line, like three, the non-emergency line yeah. to report an issue that I've been seeing along my road which um, I've tried to talk to them briefly about the issue, but I feel like the issue is not getting resolved. And it's because there's a lot of, um, I, I may get this wrong, um, like uh, non-English speaking people live living along my road at that part of the road that um are not getting the english speaking signs mm. on where they're supposed to park and where they're not supposed to park oh, because gotcha. there's arrows that direct them to where they're supposed to park and they are not supposed to be parking where they're parking mm -hmm. And it's because of the apartment building that's right there that can't, they, when they built it, they didn't build it correctly for cor a correct amount of parking spots or something like that. Right. And the parking Salmon, spots are, you on are really Creek? small. Are you like on Salmon Creek uh, Avenue? No, I'm on uh, Garrison Road. Okay. Yeah, um, it's pretty common anymore. Even some of the new uh, places, they they don't necessarily, and I'm not a traffic engineer again, um, they don't necessarily, I don't think they make them wide enough, but they have a formula that they use. And um, for us at the sheriff's office, because of staffing issues, we don't respond to um, parking issues anymore. We simply can't. Um, right. But if you're down there in Vancouver, may or they may not, I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't know how, what their policy yeah. says. But. Yeah, I have brought it right. up several times. Yeah, and maybe they may be in the same boat as we are. I'm not sure, Alex. I'm not. I don't. I just don't know. Yeah, I know for Adrian us. Did, I can't speak for us. Adrian Sorry. has a question. Yeah, so I was just looking up the 411 um, on the internet, and I found something about text to 911. 
um, and how they do uh, Clark County. And I was wondering if someone chooses to do that uh, because they can't do a voice call, what information should they include in their text message? Um, depending on what what you're calling for, right? Is it an emergency or or what? But yeah, we we I don't want to say it's uncommon. It's you know it doesn't happen all the time, but we get texts into nine one one frequently. Most of the time, they're like emergent, like. Um, but basic the basic information, who you are, how to contact you if it's text only, um, and an address and then what your issue is. I mean, you got to start with there, what, what the problem is and who you are and where you're at. Okay. And if, you, if you can text only, obviously, if you have an issue that you need somebody to come, that's not emergent, I guess, but you still need to talk to somebody. That's the best way to do it is like, I, you know, we're clearly not going to handle this call via text. It's just too much. So someone will have to show up. Okay. When we, when we began this evening, Katrina said she had a million questions. So do you have any more? <laughs> um, well, I was kind of thinking back to what you were saying about parents who don't want to call the police because they don't want their kiddo to end up in jail. Mm -hmm. And thinking about that, I think it's much, much more complicated um, also a lot more intense in the sense that parents are afraid of restraint. They're afraid of their kiddo getting shot. Um, I think it's a lot more than just the fear of jail. Um, I don't know. I know restraint is a big one. Schools have, a lot of schools have stepped up to get rid of restraint. Is that something, or have you guys looked at alternative methods instead of restraining individuals? Uh, like what? I guess. Um, I guess my my first thought is talking them down, but you're saying that's more. Sure, that's always our first. I mean, here here's the reality: it is I, I you could what if it to to death about the response you're going to get from the police. One of them is based in reality, and the other one isn't. But if it's your reality, that's your reality. If you're if, if you're scared that the police are going to shoot your kid, I guess that's your reality. I would never dream that. And again, I've been a cop for 25 years, and I've just never seen that in our community. Now, having said that, depending, I'm not a magician. And so a lot of the things that are available to the parent, like restraining or talking them down, that's, that's all I have available to me, right? And I, we certainly start with talking to that person but if a person's not open to communication and you limit them but my response down to restraint that's kind of where i'm at i i don't have this magical ability to make people behave themselves or do what we're asking them to so we do our best man we don't we do not want to get in a fight with it, especially a juvenile there is that that is the biggest loser you've ever seen for how, how is that a winner from the police standpoint it's not but you call me to, to help with a problem. And sometimes, unfortunately, that's the corner we get backed into. You've committed a crime or there's a victim. We need to take that person to jail. They don't want to go to jail. When, when we've, we've talked this thing to death. So we're at a point now where I only have a couple options. And they're like to go hands-on with your person. That's, I mean, they're, they're, if there were, if I had a, a, a better, easier way, I would be a bazillionaire because every law enforcement agency in the plan would want my idea. And we have, you know, we have less lethal alter alternatives, right? We have tasers and all those things, but all of them in, in, in employ some sort of force, right? I mean, to varying degrees. We certainly, like, we want to start as low. If I could talk everybody, in, I mean, our goal is to talk everybody in the handcuffs. And for the vast majority, you're talking about millions of encounters with the police over the course of a year, and then a fraction that end up with lethal force. Very small fraction, mathematically. So somewhere in between there, we're doing it, we're just talking to people in the handcuffs a lot. And that, that's generally what happens. But sometimes when they're in crisis, that's really difficult to do because they're not they're not even listening, right? They're not able to even, or even if they're listening to you, they're just not in a state to be able to, to do that. 
And so we try, we do our best and we talk and we talk and we talk, but at some point um, we're like, okay, we're spinning wheels here. We need to go on to a different plan. But we look to the parents to help out. I'm like, is there anything like, tell me triggers am I, if I'm making it worse than making it better because you're here with them every day. Um, if you don't think we take our interactions with juveniles extremely um, uh, serious, uh, you're wrong. We do. We no no one wants that to happen with somebody who's. We don't even want to deal with adults, let alone kids. And the law recognizes that, right? There, there. It's written statute now. You need to recognize that person if they look like a juvenile to you or claim to be. You need to treat that person differently or or. Ex ex or exhaust some other efforts and I think it's absolutely correct yeah when I lived in Spokane um, I talked to some officers and they said that they were employing mental health professionals mm -hmm. um, and that those mental health professionals would go on some cases to individuals yeah. homes and stuff do you guys have something like that here so all of ours are a crisis team that we call we do have juvenile crisis teams but again we're back to this unrealistic expectation again if we could have one in a car 24 hours a day that just drove around one for juveniles and adults or multiple because the last time we called for or i know i called for a juvenile crisis uh we're you know 35 45 minutes into the call where we're like we're not getting anywhere and they call us and they're like see you in an hour and you're like okay well, what am I supposed to do for an hour and this person who's all over the board? So, I mean, we can do better, but some of those issues are systemic in that um, I, I would love to have them embedded. And, the, and the, the departments, the largest, Seattle does a pretty good job of that, right? Um, the people that have it figured out are the ones that know that they need to be embedded and be out there all the time. There, there's just, there's, there's no better way. They, they shrink response times. They get familiar with people. That's the way to go. We're just not there yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopefully soon. Yeah. It's all about money. You know, Alex, and how we use it wisely. I, I would tell you initially, yeah, but now they're throwing a lot of money at the problem and it's still not being solved. I mean, I, I'm not going to get into how much of the money wasn't even spent, but um, there's money there. We, we, we just, it's, it's not easy. None, none of this stuff happens overnight. Hiring people and getting programs in place isn't simple. It's very difficult and it requires, um, like we said, money, time, resources, and some really good ideas, right? Some alternative ideas to what's been going on forever because it's not, it's no secret. It ain't been working that great. Yeah. And I've seen that in just my roles too, a huge increase in the number of trainings. And the, mm -hmm. so like, yeah, working with people who English is their second language, working yeah. with African-Americans and different. And I've seen that in my role, just a huge increase in mandatory trainings, which is fantastic. But it's yeah. great. But I mean, when you talk about communication, uh, you're not going to teach me Russian in a training. And so it's so difficult and we're lucky, right? When you talk about being um, a representative of your community, we're, we need to know all these languages and things. And it's great that our, our office is hiring lots of people that speak Russian or speak Spanish and we're able to do that. Um, Cause otherwise, you know, you can't really language line over the phone to talk to somebody. It's super difficult when you can't communicate, boy, you're in, you're in trouble and you do your best to try to walk through it. But it's that basic thing that we take for uh, granted where if we don't speak the same language, then we're, um, it just like compounds the difficulties, right? It's super hard. Um, and, and it's much easier when it's non-emergent. Like if I have all the time in the world, I can put you on the language line. We can deal with uh, people who are hearing, uh, hearing impaired. That, that's super easy when time allows. But we're talking about emergent situation where people's lives are at stake and there's some dangerousness to it. Some of some of that just doesn't work, right? Or somebody who just doesn't want that to happen. You got it. That has to be a two-way street. You have to get on the other end of the phone and be willing to communicate that way. There's nothing, there's no replacement for somebody who speaks the same language as 
whoever we're dealing with, that's for sure. Yeah, I'll just state that my uh, sister got in trouble once. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah, mine too. <laughs> it's a lot, actually. Had to, had to go to jail yeah. for a couple of days. Yep, I and then that. had to go live with her father for a little while. It happens. <laughs> yep. Well, I think we could, I could question you for the rest of the night, but I acknowledge that it's getting late and I, I don't want to wear you out. I super appreciate your time. I, I know this, you could be anywhere else tonight and I appreciate you spending it teaching us and learning, you know, to communicate better on both sides. And I appreciate your, what, 25 years, you said, of service? 20, and about 20, 23. 23, wow. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Because, you know, communication on it seems to break down. It's one of the first things that seems to break down. It could be for all kinds of different reasons, right? I mean, the simplest being we just don't speak the language down to my body language is giving off something different than what I'm saying. Right. So right. Um, there are so many um, problems that could be resolved if we were just able to communicate better with each other, right. Between the police and, and, and people realizing in an emergent situation, it's not always going to be a super cordial um, conversation because it can't be, there's things that need to get done. And then after that, we can talk more like civil people once things get calmed down. But when you're thrown into chaotic situations um, and trying to make sense of things that you have just partial information on, it can be so hard. It's hard enough just when things are, you know, I guess normal for lack of a better term. Well, thank you for going to work every day and helping support um, law enforcement and family. So thank you. thank you. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate what you guys are doing. Well, thank you. And you've gotten about four or five thank yous in the chat here. And I, I'm just so happy you spent your time with us tonight. I appreciate everyone else that hopped on the call. and Later, Brenda. Well, later, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> later, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank time. you if you need anything else Brenda you got my number and you have the, my my email and stuff so um just <laughs> let me know I will yeah. thank you so much hey uh Brenda don't ever thank forget you. your red jacket I will it's not important. I will wear that for the holidays right yep <laughs> gotta have it thanks what you guys. I remember thanks. You guys. later thank have you. a good night thank you, you too. thank you bye bye bye, bye Katrina Bye, Alex. Have a good night. Be safe. Don't do anything too stupid and uh, <laughs> be real. And I'll talk okay. to you next week. Okay. Sometime. Sounds good. See ya. All right. Bye.